one of the benefits of listing your house in January or in February is you get that first rush of buyers that is just so hungry and so excited and and honestly so frustrated that they they just throw the kitchen sink at you and and they want the house. So that's yeah. what happened. Mm -hmm. How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Sean and Matt Show. My name is Matt. That is Sean, and welcome to our show. Sean, Thursday, January 21st, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about Biden's, one of his first executive orders being extending the foreclosure moratorium, rents dropping by 15% in the local Ooh. area, and a little real estate P-O-R-N, looking at Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris's $8 million worth wow. of real estate, um, one of them being right downtown, which is pretty cool, and, and we'll amazing. get into that. How's your Thursday the 21st going for you? Man, it's pretty good. I'll tell you what, January is busy. Um, we've got a lot of listings coming up. I know congratulations on your recent sale. That was an amazing sale. How many offers did you get? Got 10 offers, um, all of them, at, you know, most of them over $25,000, a few of them over $50,000 over the list price. So clearly, um, you know, I, I hate being cliche and saying that the spring market starts in January, but one of the benefits of listing your house in January or in February is you get that first rush of buyers that is just so hungry and so excited and, and honestly so frustrated that they just throw the kitchen sink at you and and they want the house so that's yeah what happened. and i was telling i had a listing appointment this morning and i was saying listen sometimes it's better to come on before spring market because there's just no inventory the buyers are there we know they're there but you're the first one out there and you're just going to get crushed with offers it's amazing yeah so the first topic of today's video will be the foreclosure moratorium um this is an executive order that president biden has signed along with 16 other executive orders and essentially this is a further extension of the eviction and foreclosure moratorium to at least march 31st um, now I, I think what's happening here is that everything is getting pushed back and pushed back and um, there are reports that there's up to 1.8 million people uh, with past due mortgages and it, you know 90 plus day delinquencies and and it may be even higher than that at this point. So um, what Biden is doing is is pushing things back even further as opposed to I don't want, I don't know if it, opening up the floodgates is the right way to yeah. do it, but um, essentially pushing things back. What are your what are your thoughts on that? I I mean it's scary. It's a scary thing. We've seen this happen before in the past, and uh, it can totally change markets. Uh, I don't think we'll see a lot of it here. I'm hoping we don't see a lot of it here, um, but it's probably going to be spread out throughout the United States. But uh, one point something million people are affected by this, and as we don't open, you know, we're we're still in this horrible situation we're in, where the businesses aren't opening. So how are they going to make money? So I think that. That number could keep rising. Hopefully, uh, they're able to do some sort of refinance because the rates are amazing right now. I know they're probably not going to have any cash to do that, but maybe they can somehow get around that, get their interest rate down so they can make it a little more affordable. Um, but, you know, once what's going to happen once all of this just says, all right, well, this mor moratorium's over, here's 1.2 million foreclosures that could be hitting the market that's going to flood the real estate market and you know bring that whole thing down the article from housingwire.com says that there are more than 11 million mortgages guaranteed by the va department of agriculture and the hud that would be affected by the extension of the foreclosure moratorium so you know while we may have this number of 1.8 million or maybe a little bit higher right now of people 90 plus days past delinquent there's significantly more people that are maybe in the forbearance process or are a little bit you know closer in you know maybe less than 90 days delinquent and 
you know, that the talk is, okay, when is the, the, the card house, the house of cards going to come crashing down? When is the bubble going to pop? When are all the foreclosures going to hit the market? And depending on where you are in the world and, and in the United States, that may or may not happen. It's something has to happen. Something, something bad has to happen. It's, it's probably not going to happen in DC. It's probably not going to happen in New York in terms of a flood of foreclosures. But yeah. with this many people being behind on payments and this many loans being affected, you know, we can keep pushing things back and back and back, but we're eventually, you know, going to reach a breaking point where there's going to be a significant number of, I don't know, short sales, fire sales, whatever you want to call them, where these payments from these people that have been laid off have, have not had jobs. That's going to catch up to them. At it some totally point. is. I mean, and hopefully at the time when, this process starts, right? Hopefully banks are forgiving in a way that they say, all right, well, listen, let's work to, because honestly, I don't, banks don't want to go through that foreclosure process. I mean, back in the day when there, there were short sales and foreclosures, it's a long process, but I'll tell you that, that all the banks have insurance for this kind of stuff. So, you know, in, on one side, they're not going to really lose any money if they do go through that foreclosure process because they've got insurance that covers them usually. Um, but oh, man, I've seen this happen before. We've had huge drops in the market. Uh, I don't think it's going to have the same effect because the economic factors aren't there quite like it was back then. Um, but it's a scary thing. You know, it can it can drive a market down very quickly. Imagine we're sitting here right now. We have no inventory, and all of a sudden we have tons of inventory. We have such a high buyer pool here. There's such so many buyers that it'll be gobbled up very quickly. But think about like the Midwest somewhere where the buyer pool isn't as large. That's probably where those people are going to be affected most. And and that's my fear, I guess. I don't think, like you said, New York, D.C., probably not affected as much. We kind of gobble that stuff up. Yeah, in terms of foreclosures in Arlington, I did a search recently for North Arlington foreclosures in 2020. And there were seven properties um, that were I don't want to call them foreclosures, but they were not standard sales. So mm. maybe they were court ordered sales, maybe they were short sales, whatever. But in North Arlington in the past year, there have been about seven. So certainly not a lot, maybe a needle in the haystack, but uh, there's there's got to be more, right? I, there you know where to I be think more. you're right. Well, I think in, this in the future at least. In the future there's where it's going to hit, I believe if this condo market doesn't turn around, there's a lot of people that purchased in the last few years and they're, they're buying at high values, right? They're buying at high prices. So if these people aren't working right now and they're a part of that more, more whatever moratorium, um, they're going to be affected because right now it's tough to sell the condos. So even if they're trying to sell, they're saying, all right, I need to get from out of this. I'm just going to try to sell and get some for, sort of forgiveness when I do sell or whatever. Uh, I think it, it could hit us, you know, it could hit that condo market. The single family, it's not going to happen because there's just so much competition. And that's where we're in the past, what, eight months has changed. But before that, we didn't see a lot of foreclosures because the prices just keep going up. So anybody could sell and get out from whatever they bought it for in the past. Um, now we saw the largest, the, the highest price, the peak of the price was probably January right? February timeframe of, of 2020. And now those prices have come down. So any, anybody that's bought in that time frame and now they've lost their job, it's foreclosure time. Yeah. I think that's the perfect storm of, you yeah. know, you're, you're overpaying, you're winning the bidding war, you're waving all the contingencies, you're doing what you're supposed to do to win the, the condo. And then quarantine happens, you know, the layoffs happen. And then uh, you know, you may, you know, you may not have a job and then do you, you know, you start reevaluating. Do you really want to be in the DC area if you don't have that job that, that you've had? So, um, certainly something to watch over the next, definitely. Um, we'll see if it's years. extended again. Um, we'll watch the markets and hopefully, uh, it doesn't have a huge effect, but it's probably going to. Speaking of, um, you know, the moratoriums, this also includes evictions, which looking at the rental market in Arlington, an article just came out by apartmentlist.com and Arlington now, a R L now.com that says that rents in Arlington County have dropped by 15% wow. since last March, uh, analysis by the U S census bureau data by apartment, uh, list.com. And you know, when, 
whenever you're leasing an apartment, whenever you're renting an apartment for the past five years, if you've had to renew your lease, you basically just get an email saying, hey, we'd love to have you stay. By the way, we're raising your rent 6%, and if you don't agree, you can leave. My, how the turn tables, <laughs> because now, yeah. to the surprise of absolutely no one, Arlington has dropped by 15%. I don't think the rent, I don't think it was overpriced. Like, I think it, they were market value, and I just think that we've seen a tremendous amount of um, vacancies, and now it's only natural that the rents are going to drop. And I've even heard stories that those um, renewal notices that have come have included price decreases. Wow, now, really? Which is something that is uh, almost unheard of. Keep them in, in there, right? In Arlington County. Smart to keep and them in. People have been asking me, landlords and, and even sellers, like, Hey, I have a renter in there now. They're thinking about extending. Yes, extend, extend the lease. And you know, th and this was a, a a a sell or a rent opportunity for a condo. And they were saying, Hey, should I rent this out until spring 2022 or try to sell? You know, in the July August time frame of this year. And I was like, Listen, if you have a renter in there paying anywhere near or close to market value ride this out for a little bit, see how 2021 shakes out. And if you have a renter in there, keep them. And then let's try selling it in the spring market. Yeah, it's funny. I have two examples of this. We had uh, a client purchase a condo rate uh, at probably not the best time, to be honest, uh, for renting, right? They were they were buying it to as an investment. And we put that thing on, on the rental market and it took a really long time. And honestly, they took about 15%, a 15% cut from what the market was. So it's funny that, that we actually see this article now. Second thing is I got a call this morning from a, from a woman that uh, has a rental property here and she's usually able to rent it. Uh, and, and she said that it's been vacant since July. And she's like, what do I, what should I do? Should I try to rent it? Like, can I offer, you know, I offered her our services. Yeah, we can, we can rent it or we can sell it, whatever. But it just goes to show you that there's a lot of people out there that they're, they're not really affected by it because this is her second place. And, you know, she, I, I don't think she really needs the money, but she can't rent it. Normally, you can rent those things like that. And not only that, the, the reason this is coming down as well is because there's been so much construction in the last few years of building these massive rental buildings. So all of the condo owners that have owned and have rented now are competing against these massive buildings that have all the brand new stuff. And now these companies are giving all this these incentives away. And so how do you compete as the little guy competing in, against these big buildings? Right, and your condos may be 10 or 15 years older than whatever yeah. the new building is. On the, uh, the list from apartmentlist.com, Arlington comes in seventh place of the cities that have had the, the most um, rental decreases. The top six will not surprise you, and, and honestly, you could probably guess all six of these off the bat. They are San Jose, Washington, D.C., New York, Boston, Seattle, and number one with a negative 26.7%, negative 27% rent growth since March is San Francisco, which is the surprise of no one with all the, uh, the tech companies, um, you know, moving to remote uh, working for the most part. Now, what are your thoughts on prematurely lowering the rent um, for a tenant that is living in the property right now, almost as a goodwill gesture before the renewal comes up. So let's say they have six, month, six months left in the lease. You say, hey, by the way, you know, tough times, I'm going to lower your rent a hundred bucks, something like that. Yeah. I mean, that's a great idea uh, if you can afford it, right? There's a lot of people that are that are uh, cash flow negative. Do you really think area. that's a good idea? Because I mean, these landlords maybe they're already taking a haircut on some of their properties. That's, that's what I'm saying. Is like, what if they're already a cash flow negative? Because let's be honest, this area is expensive, and a lot of people are just like, hey, let me just um, cash flow. You know, as long as I can get close. So yeah, it sounds like a nice gesture, but is it actually a smart gesture? I mean, if I can keep my renter in there at the same price, I'm going to keep him at the same price if he's not having a problem, right? Um, so be careful what you offer. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think, um, like I said, there's a lot of people that you, I had, I had another client uh, reach out to me today and he was like, Hey, can you find me something that needs a rehab and, and is cash flow positive? And I'm like, 
that's impossible to find right now. Like, because first of all, finding something that's cash flow positive, you have to put a ton of money down. And I would buy it first. Yeah, and I would buy it first. And so, and you're also competing against all of the iBuyers buyers out there that are looking for the same thing. So that we've had a flood of, of investors come in that are big animals that have all this equity that they can afford to do this stuff. So that whole segment is really difficult in this area now. Yeah, the article goes on to say that principal cities are seeing the most rental declines as opposed to suburban cities, which haven't been hit as hard. Some of the cities, uh, quote unquote, affordable mid-sized cities where we have seen rent growth increases include cities like Albuquerque, Toledo, Greensboro, North Carolina, Fresno, California, Chesapeake, Virginia, and the number one city with 9.7% increase in growth, meaning that people are moving there maybe on a short-term basis to see how it is. Boise, Idaho. What's going on in Boise? Apparently a lot of things. <laughs> Dude, you sleep on Boise, Idaho. Don't Jeez. sleep on Boise. Oh, it's probably I've beautiful. Heard amazing things really? about Idaho. I think it's a great location for people from California to maybe check out Idaho, you know go what? to That's the mountains. True. Yeah, they're probably moving out and they're saying, wow, this is so cheap. I'll pay you whatever, right? And big business yeah. to be had in Boise. There's a couple um, big big YouTubers that live there and they like drive their Teslas and they have like new construction houses, which probably cost pennies on the dollar. I'm they, they probably cost a lot, but compared to here, they probably cost a lot less. Yeah. Well, and another, like Chesapeake, Virginia, I wonder what's going on there. I mean, you know, that's, I guess, a military installation pretty close, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't and, have. But maybe that's yeah. the exodus of D.C., you know, because that's more south. That's more Virginia Beach area, I believe. Right. Um. So I don't know. That's That's funny. We'll have to see what happens with the Arlington rent, DC rent, and, and basically principal city rent scenarios because um, they're going to be hurting for the next couple couple years, really. And what we're seeing with these all new apartments that you see, you see the big cranes, you see the new developments. Well, there's there's kind of this hybrid model coming where um, short term um, hotels are renting out a couple floors. Sean actually has firsthand experience with that, where let's imagine you're an apartment complex, you have 300 units you need a lease, people are clearly not leasing them. Well, why not rent out you know, 100 or, or 50 of those units to a short-term hotel company who can kind of pay you half as much or, or pay you some sort of amount as opposed to have them sitting empty. It's funny. We were just, I had a listing appointment this morning and um, th my client was in the commercial real estate side of things. And we were actually talking about this. Um, why hotel is one of them th that I stayed in up in Boston. I thought, wow, what a clever idea. This is such a smart thing. All these empty uh, apartments, let's just rent them as hotels. Um, but now What's happening is uh, there's just not that demand. And so a lot of these companies are struggling. And so what his company is doing is, you know, they've got this equity firms that they're they're collecting all this, this money and they're buying out buildings that are starting to hurt, right? In certain areas, all these, these uh, apartment buildings that thought they would be rented by now are not. The, the uh, hotel side of things that, that we're talking about aren't working out either. So now they're hurting and it's like, what do we do? And now these big, big firms are swallowing them up. Smart. All right. So our third topic is taking a look at Kamala Harris's $8 million real estate portfolio. It is not often that we're looking at articles from the New York Post, but here we are. Um, congratulations to President Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris. You know, I, I know where the president lives. Um, do you know where the vice president lives? I never knew this until today. They live at one observatory circle, the Navy observatory. You know the no, I didn't know the that. circle. Yeah, driving up, um, really no cool idea. house. But I, I'm just gonna. That's so funny. Be I've honest, never I did that. not know where the vice president lives. Did you know where the vice president lives? I didn't know where. where I didn't either. They no, I had no. I didn't even think about it. To yeah. be honest, I've never even thought about that. That's yeah, so put him in the guest house of the White House. Yeah, or... just kick him down the street. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, put him in the basement or something. All right, so um, Kamala Harris, eight million dollars worth that of is real estate. Amazing. How did she amass that eight million bucks? I, I don't mean, know. I know she was a pretty high, high profile lawyer for a long time, right? So she, the first one that's listed is a house in Brentwood, Los Angeles. Harris's husband bought the house um, in 2012 
uh, two years before he and Harris married. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, the article says, look at Kamala Harris's real estate portfolio. The it's first combined. House is, yeah, it's his. It's kind of yeah. Um, Harris's. It's the uh, the f- the spouse, the first vice. What's yeah. the lexicon for that? Yeah. The, the um first. The second man, because it's not second, first lady. Second, it's second lady man. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. <laughs> second um, man. Either way, uh, they bought the house <laughs> for two point eight million dollars. There's a nice Google, uh, bird's eye view under an wow. LLC. So they bought it for two point eight. The house is valued at nearly five point two million. Can you imagine that? I mean, like, think of the, that's more than half of their whole portfolio right, right there, which is really well. Amazing. The house is doubled in value. It's doubled in value. In Can you a, imagine buying it for two point eight, eight and selling in it nine for years. Five? Well, wow. I guess nine years is, is quite some time. That's so awesome. The the, uh, the second house, um, second property is actually in Washington D.C. at the West Light um, Condominium at eleven eleven twenty fourth Street Northwest. This is one of the the buildings where if if you're it's kind of like a who's who's of dc it's a really good pied tear type of it's a cool residence. looking building too it's different um the, harris owns a 1700 square foot condo at the Westlight condominium two bedroom two bathroom uh you know pretty straightforward floor to ceiling high scale amenities i think it's what you would expect from a boutique 71 units building that you know has top of the line uh, oh, yeah. appliances high end finishes nice stuff. everything that you want from you know your your hangout when you're not at one observatory circle yeah That's she funny. bought the modern apartment in 2017 for 1.75 million um it is now recently appraised for 1.98 million according to realtor.com I don't think realtor.com appraises property. Maybe they're talking about a algorithm. Probably. Yeah. So algorithm. she bought it for 1.75 with the current market. The it's way probably it is, down a little bit by maybe 1. not 1.98, you know, but they, they did. They, I'm sure they saw a huge uptick. She bought it at the right time in 2017 because Amazon announced in what? 2018. So then we saw a huge increase in prices. Um, but yeah, it's probably coming down. Yeah, this is good. So Matt's looking on realtor.com to see, uh, I don't know, know if this saying. is the exact one, but um, if it is, it says last sold for one point nine million dollars. So either way, um, it appears to be a penthouse, fourteen hundred square foot um, unit. I, I'd have to look more into that to see what exactly that entails. That's awesome. So two properties right there. You're at uh, almost almost eight million. Yeah. Um, so she has her. Ha- I mean, she's from California, right. so she has her her L A house, mm-hmm. which you know, the, the new husband bought or whatever. Yeah. And then she has her DC condo, which is to be expected. Sure. And so that brings us to the third property. Honestly, I thought there were going to be more yeah, I did properties. Too. Yeah. Um, the third property is a South of market. Soma, San Francisco condo. So mm. DC, we have Noma and, uh, San Francisco has Soma. So Harris bought this loft style apartment while a, a dis- being a district attorney in San Francisco in 20, 2004 for $489,000 because it's San Francisco. It have, has course it, uh, it has of course doubled in value and is now worth $890,000. Good investments, man. You know, it's all about location. That's what they say. You buy in the right places. You're going to see some increase in value and that's smart. Buying in San Francisco in 2004, probably so, a good idea. So awesome. It was given a $21,000 facelift by bold interior designer Ken Folk in 2013. Hmm. Um, interesting. It looks like uh, there's an article in the San Francisco Chronicle right. that details the facelift. So, so three properties. I mean, most. I think most politicians would surprise you with the amount of properties that they own. I, th- I think most politicians don't want you to know how many mm-hmm. properties that you own. Um, you know, John McCain. He owned eight properties. Um, you know, back in the day, one of them was a condo at Crystal Gateway yeah. in Crystal City. Yeah. So I, it doesn't really surprise me. I honestly, I, I kind of thought she had more and, and maybe she does have more and, and she's kind of keeping them a secret. But, you know, good for her. Yeah, good for her. Three properties worth over eight million dollars. That's insane. That's great. I think she's and, and think, she's think about it. Right. What did she buy it for? She bought them for two point something one. So, I mean. Yeah, she's gained most of that in equity. It's crazy. And that's that's why you buy. That's why you hold. 
right? Yeah, she's uh, she's she's done well. So um, cool. That's awesome. That's it. That's all we got, guys. <laughs> so there you have it. Foreclosures are they coming? Maybe, maybe not. They're, I feel like they will. I feel like they've got to. But like everyone thinks they're they're gonna happen next week and like next month, like all of North Arlington's gonna be in foreclosure. Yeah, and you know, I was reading an article this morning about how like everybody's saying, oh, the the crash of twenty twenty one is coming, is coming. And then there was an article like, no, nah, I don't think so. You know, I don't yeah. think so. I think that the lack of inventory that that could have a, an effect. That will have an effect. But I don't. I'm I'm just always hopeful. I hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> There's you know? opportunities to be had in there every always is, market. and that's the thing is, once they're not selling, that's when you start buying them. Yeah, right. Yeah, there you go. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching. For Sean and myself, until next time, we'll see you then. Take care.